incoercible multi-party computation and universally compossible receipt free voting. The authors are Joel Alwyn, Rafael Ostrowski, Hong Sheng Zhu, and Vasily Zikas, and Vasilis will be giving the talk. Uh, thank you, and thanks to everyone who stayed until this very last uh, talk of crypto. I'm gonna try to keep it light. So, um, so okay, uh, the talk is gonna be split in two parts. The first part, I'm gonna uh, discuss a uh, universally composable definition of uh, incoercible computation. And in the second part, I will discuss uh, an instantiation, a multi-party protocol which is UC incoercible. And in particularly, this implies the first UC secure receipt-free e-voting protocol. As you'll see, uh, incoercibility and receipt-freeness, they go uh, hand, hand in hand. Okay. So uh, very, very briefly, you already saw this slide in several uh, versions in, already in this crypto, I guess in this session. Um, Security of multi-party protocols is defined in the, via the real ideal paradigm. In the real world, we have the parties that execute their, uh, their protocols, and there is an adversary that corrupts some party and uses him to cheat the other parties. And in the ideal world, the parties have access to a fully trusted party, a functionality, that takes inputs from the parties. And so essentially, the parties just are dummy forwarders that take input from, the, from their environment, they give it the functionality, and the functionality just computes whatever they want to compute and gives them the, 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 the output. And the corrupted party is controlled by a simulator whose goal is to make this ideal setting indistinguishable from the real setting for any such environment. So formally, we would require that for any adversary attacking the real protocol, there exists a simulator, so that for every environment, those two things are indistinguishable. This was very brief, but you've heard of it. Okay. What, this is the standard uh, notion that we you know, all know and trust. And in this work, we're gonna augment it with a new beast, namely coercion. So we have corruption, we'll put coercion. What is coercion? First, how does it compare to co corruption? When an adversary corrupts a party, what he does is he takes control of this party. So he just becomes this party and tries to cheat the other parties. In coercion, on the other hand, uh, we don't have someone taking control of the coerced party. Just an external entity goes and asks the coerced party to do something different than what it's supposed to do. And now the challenge of the coerced party is not to cheat its peers, but rather to cheat its, uh, to, to, to deceive its coercer. So to give you an example, let's look at the prototypical scenario of uh, incoercibility, which is voting, right? You have uh, Don here, he goes to a voter, and says, please vote for my uh, nephew A. Now the voter is really brave and he doesn't like A, so he goes in the booth and votes for B. And he's even more brave and he goes back and says, okay, I voted for A. <laughs> but he can pull this off in case of a standard election because he does everything in the booth, there's no trail. But if this is an electronic voting protocol, then actually the transcript of the protocol is a proof of what he voted in most protocols. So, you know, if the boss goes and says, okay, prove it to me, show me your transcript, then he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, very, on a very, very high level, the goal of an incoercible protocol is to help this guy pull this trick off. <laughs> right? And in the voting literature, this is called receipt freeness, because it essentially means that this protocol that this guy is running has no actual receipt that the, the boss here can ask. Okay, so let's try to kind of make this intuition more formal. How can we define incoercibility? What does it mean that the protocol is incoercible? First attempt, a protocol is incoercible if the coercer cannot tell if the party is lying. Right? This sounds really like a, a dream definition, but that's what it is, it's a dream. And the reason is that, okay, what if the party is a swing voter? Right? What if the party deceiving just changes the output. And of course, the coercer can catch him. That doesn't work, second attempt. Okay, let's assume he's not a swing voter, right? <laughs> Obvious thing. Actually, this is a notion of incoercibility which is used in the concept of receipt-free voting. It has some meaning, but as cryptographers, we know that it's just there about, just there not about only this guy's input and output, right? The coercer might know more inputs <coughs> of other guys, and by that, he can deduce whether uh, the, the coerced party cheated or not. So the final attempt is um, we want that the coercer cannot tell that the coerced party is deceiving him by any other means than just using the output of the function that we are computing. And by this we get all the guarantees that we got in the previous attempts and you know, much more. 
So this is actually the approach that has been taken in the literature for incorrigibility for general functions, not just for voting, uh, in a sequence of work by Canetti and Gennaro in 96, that was the first one, then uh, later Moran and Naor, uh, Unruh and Mulekwade, and Canetti, Goldwasser, and uh, Poburiana very, uh, Poburinaya very recently. So why are there so many attempts to define incorrigibility? The reason is that the problem has many parameters that one needs to take into account. So there are questions of the type, okay, do coerced parties know who is corrupted so that they avoid them in their protocol? Um, do coerced parties know each other and can they coordinate to cheat their deceiver? So say that me and uh, Rosario are both coerced. Can we go behind the back of the mafia boss and coordinate the way we're gonna cheat? I guess uh, Rosario knows Italian, right? More, more, more about mafia than me. So <laughs> you leave that. So uh, another obvious question is uh, standalone security versus UC security. Here, UC security is not just about composition. Of course, you know when you when you're UC secure, you get composition alongside uh, any protocol or in any environment. But here, the point is that in this case, we can have a non-line coercer. So the coercer can adapt his strategy depending on what happens in the protocol. And the final question is, uh, what type of coercion requests we allow? So do you want a protocol that just protects against the attack I described before, the attack where the party plays its protocol, he votes as he's supposed to, and just needs to produce a, a receipt, or do we want something which allows a more evasive coercion type, like this so-called active coercion? I'm gonna say in the next couple of slides what I mean by passive and active. So first of all, what does it mean to coerce a machine, a Turing machine? Well, this is essentially telling to whoever is using the Turing machine to use another Turing machine. So a coercion corresponds to a transformation of the protocol of a party to another protocol, which we'll call C. It's a mapping of protocols to coerced, if you want, protocols. So the case of semi-honest or passive coercion, this corresponds to the traditional receipt-freeness notion from the voting literature is a case where we have a coercer, in that case the coercer is the environment, that um, goes to the, so it, it does whatever the environment does, it gives the inputs to the, to the party, the party runs its actual protocol, pi, but at any point the coercer might give it a special input, which is, you know, show me your view, or this would be the receipt that the boss would ask before, and the party is supposed to produce his view. So the actual re co coercion request is, replying by the view. So, of course, this is the weaker form. We can have a more evasive form where the actual coercer is online. So he just tells through the protocol to the party what he's supposed to do. So this should be your first message, M1. The party does it, gets the first message from the protocol, then sends it to its coercer, second message, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now uh, a few words about what has been done so far in terms of uh, definitions. So the, the first two uh, definitions by uh, Canetti, Gennaro, and uh, Moran and Naor are not UC, they're in the standalone case. Uh, and their main difference is that uh, CG is for passive coercion, like receipt freeness, and the, uh, uh, Moran and Naor is for active coercion. Uh, so the first work that put this incoercibility notion within UC was uh, by Unruh and Mulekwade in uh, Eurocrypt 2010. And they actually consider both active and passive coercion. They are, as I said, in UC. The main issue is that um, they have a slightly counterintuitive uh, side effect of the definition, which is that they implicitly assume that the coerced parties know who is corrupted. So, in other words, the coercer cannot use the adversary as an informant to check upon coerced parties. And second, uh, they implicitly allow coordination when, someone is, when several coerced parties are trying to deceive. Um, the most recent work by Canetti et al. Uh, considers passive corruption, but it's for the two-party case. It's not really clear how to extend it to the multi-party case. Of course, they are, in, uh, they are also in UC, and their protocol is two-party. Interesting, also the protocol suggested by the previous work is only a two-party protocol, and it's not clear how to extend it. So in this work, we consider both active and passive co uh, coercion uh, in combination with active corruption, everything here. Uh, so uh, we, the deceivers do not know who is adversarial. Uh, they cannot coordinate with each other. And we are in UC, multi-party, everything that we would like to have. 
Okay, so I, okay, I promised I'm gonna try to keep it light, right? This is the kind of only heavy part of the talk, this slide, which unfortunately, as it's usually the case, is also the meat of it, so. Okay, so bear with me for, through this slide. Um, what are we trying to capture with our definition? The intuition we're trying to capture is that the coercer should not be able to get any more information on whether the party that he's coercing is deceiving him, is not running the coerce strategy, than what he can deduce from the inputs and outputs. And we want that to be the case for any possible deceiving strategy that that party might be uh, using. So what does it mean? It means that if we consider those two worlds, the top world where the parties are actually running the protocol that the coercer requested, and the bottom world where they're trying to deceive him, so they're trying to lie, then the distance between those two worlds is not much different, oh, sorry, not much different than the distance between the effect that having these strategies has on the input-output behavior of the function. So in order to give the definition, I need to tell you what those four worlds are. Formally, the first one is easy, right? It's the actual uh, world that we have when honest parties are running their protocol, coerced parties are running the strategy that the coercer requests, and corrupted parties do whatever corrupted parties do. Okay, so what is the effect of running this protocol? The easiest way to see what the effect is is to think just of uh, the, co the coercion as being semi-honest coercion. So this means that the party is running the protocol and occasionally, whenever the, uh, the coercer asks, will produce a receipt that is running with the uh, actual input that the coercer wants. Well, just because this is actually the same protocol, what we get is that this world here is indistinguish indistinguishable from the world where the actual functionality is evaluated. But now the difference is that these guys here might take an extra request to give a view. And this request cannot dealt with if the world, if those guys are dummy, then they will just forward it to the functionality. The functionality doesn't know what to do with this request. So what we do instead is whenever they get such a request, one of those extra messages, they forward this request to the simulator, and now the simulator is in charge of producing the receipt. So this is the top part. Now the bottom part is the part where the parties are lying. And the, the easiest of those two worlds is actually the, the effect of a lie. What is the effect of a lie in the implementation of a function? Oops, okay, you can see the relevant part. So the effect of a lie is essentially changing my input and output, right? So it's a deception strategy. It's changing my interface to the functionality. This is a lie in the ideal setting. And a lie in the real setting is a translation of this to a protocol. Right? So, what our definition will require, and here comes the heaviest part, oh, oh God, it went away immediately, okay. So here comes the heaviest part, is that, so this, the, the, for whatever deception, whatever lie the parties want to tell, there is a way to tell this lie, to do this deception, in the real protocol. In other words, there is a simulator such that for every such lie, there, uh, there exists a real life that for every adversary, those worlds are indistinguishable and those worlds are indistinguishable, which will in particular mean that those distances are uh, preserved. Okay, let's look at this definition for a while because that's not the most trivial thing. Okay, so there are several things. One is that you might notice that those deceiving strategies are vectors. This exactly captures the fact that deception is not coordinated. There is no central guy that defines what those guys are going to do. Each of them is running a local transformation. So this means that deception is local. This example with me and Rosario collaborating is excluded here. Second, the simulator comes before the deceptions. This means that the simulator is not aware of the lie that we're going to say. If you were aware, then this top equation here would be meaningless because there is no deception in this top equation. And the third, and equally important, is the fact that the adversary comes after the deception, which means that the guys that try to deceive here have no idea who is corrupted. So we get all the properties that we would want. Very, very relevant 
it's the same adversary in both of those experiments. I don't require that there exists an adversary, there exists a simulator for an adversary here, and there exists another simulator for an adversary here. It's the same through this entire four walls, which is what will allow us to preserve this distance. Okay, so uh, hopefully I didn't lose many of you, but those that I did lose now can jump uh, back on board because I'm going to discuss the construction and the construction you won't need to really understand the definition for understanding why this construction is incoercible. Okay, and to go back to a lighter version, let me make a first attempt, and so let me just, first of all, stick to semi-honest coercion, just to receive freeness, and let me make a first attempt to build a, an incoercible protocol from the standard setup that we're using in UC, a common reference tree. As I'm gonna show, we cannot do that. Why so? So what we have is our uh, environment, who is also our coercer, and the party that is running <laughs> The, the protocol, which should produce a receipt when requested, and we have also a CRS, so the party takes the CRS, and assume that at that point, the coercer issues a request for a, a receipt. This is a request for the entire view, right? The party needs to produce such a view, and what does this view include? It includes the value of the CRS. It has to include that because the coercer can check that from the corrupted parties, and all the random coins that he's gonna use he hasn't used them. He can fake them, but he hasn't used them yet, so it doesn't make any difference to try to fake them. And knowing all this stuff and this guy's input, all the messages that he's supposed to send through the protocol are deterministically defined. So any way that he will try to deceive, any deviation from this protocol, means that he needs to send one of those deterministically defined messages differently. But if it happens that the receiver of this message is corrupted, then he is caught. And the probability of that happening is pretty high. It's at least one over n, even if one is corrupted. So the CRS is excluded. And this example exactly demonstrates the power of having uh, informants that help the, the coercer. Okay? So it totally demonstrates that. It also shows what we need to assume in order to get incoercibility. We need to assume a setup that parties can lie about, right? They can, from the beginning, give something which then they can stick on. So our solution uses something which has been used in, uh, the, in, in, in actual implementation of uh, voting, of electronic voting, and it's honestly generated hardware tokens, and they look like this. So the token has internally stored a key for every party. We have n parties. There are n keys. And what it does is it computes an additive secret sharing of each of the keys, and authenticated additive secret sharing of each of the keys. So each share has an authentication tag, and it gives to each party his share of each of those keys and the authentication tag. This means that all those parties together hold all those keys. Any n minus one of those parties have no information, and there is no way they can lie about those keys because they are authenticated. Okay, so, and the next mode that this token can be used is any party can query the token, and the token will return with an input, and the token will return an encryption with his key of that input. So this is the functionality that we need from our token. And now we can actually uh, construct a, a, an incoercible UC secure protocol, and we're using their uh, standard UC secure protocol. And the idea is, let's, if this is the function that we compute, the parties first query the tokens, they get all their shares and their authentication tags, and then they query the token. Every party queries the token on his own input and gets an encryption. And finally, what they do is they pull all this information together into an MPC, traditional MPC. You can use CLOS there, your favorite UC protocol. And what the MPC does is it first reconstructs the keys, right? Then it uses the keys to decrypt the encryptions and it outputs the function. So I won't go into many details, but I will give you an intuition of why this construction is secure. Probably you already see the intuition. It's, not, it's, it's a very simple intuition. Um, so first, because all the, the keys are authenticated, there's no way that parties, even adversarial parties, can lie about their keys. Hence, the correct decryption keys, which are also the encryption keys, will be reconstructed. Hence, this will be, the only thing that the adversary can do is just give a fake YI, but that's just choosing a different input, essentially and the output will be properly generated. And there is no privacy leak because 
those keys are never revealed in plain, right? They are always put just in the MPC and everything happens under the hood of the MPC. So the reconstruction of the keys, all this stuff happened within the MPC. So no information on the keys leak. Now, um, why is this uh, incoercible? How can the adversary, uh, how, how, can, how can a coerced party deceive its coercer? It just takes its favorite input and queries that to the token. And then, as a receipt to its adversary, he just generates a random message, right? What he gets from the token is an encryption. So the random message is indistinguishable. And the only information that the adversary gets through the protocol is just the output and a view which is simulated because we're running close within this protocol. So this means that essentially he can just lie by simply querying another input, his favorite input, and just generating a random uh, receipt for his query to the token. You know, I mean, this is very high level, of course. There's a lot of things and tricks that need to be played in the action proof. And you know, if you're interested, please look at the paper. And in particular, a big difficulty is that we need to have the same adversary and simulator in both those experiments. This is a hassle. But the good news is that this very simple protocol uh, also tolerates active coercion. So even in the case where the adversary is over the shoulder of the party, still this protocol works with a different analysis, though. Okay, so to conclude, what we saw here is a general universally composable notion of incoercibility, which is flexible. We can define different coercion types. And we also presented the first multi-party incoercible UC protocol, which in particularly implies the first multi-party incoercible or receipt-free, as it's known, uh, evoting protocol. And some open problems. Uh, Okay, so this is, of course, motivated by voting. And another property which is very relevant in voting is verifiability. Uh, actually, there is no definition of uh, composable verifiability, let alone a joint definition of verifiability and coercibility. So this is something that we are actually working on. The second one, which is, uh, in my opinion, also very interesting, is I, I argued before that the CRS is not sufficient for gaining coercibility. Our solution uses this one might argue very powerful hardware token. So the question is, where is the line? Could we characterize, or actually could we find even weaker setups? Not just not characterize is the end of the, of the story. Can we find weaker setups than that one that are still sufficient for getting incoercibility? And there is a hope that we might be able to use IO there, because again, the whole goal is that I can lie about what's in there. So, and with that, I would like to uh, thank you and wish you a safe, Trip back. There is time for one question. If